Romans chapter 12 uh, is where we are. And uh, last week we, we uh, did uh, verses 3 through 8. Uh, I mentioned last week we, we spent most of the time on verse 3 and then we just briefly covered a little bit on, the, on some of the gifts that are listed there. As I mentioned last week, we're not going, we're not going to teach in detail on any of those gifts because uh, a number of months ago we actually did a whole series of studies on spiritual gifts and they're all available on our website at restorationlifechurch.tv. So if, you're, if you'd like to listen to those, the audio format for all those are available. Uh, so tonight we're going to be in Romans chapter 12. We're going to pick it up in verse 9 in, in a moment. And there, there, is a, there is a list of character traits in, uh, in this passage that really actually 27 different character traits by my count, if, if I'm right. Um, it, it, it's really hard to find another list like this in the New Testament where, where there are this many, one after another, very serious, very challenging callings um, uh, upon a Christian's, a Christian's life. Uh, however, I, th- I think this passage really talks, it teaches us a lot about, about being, what, what being like Jesus really means. And so um, we're not going to cover all of them tonight. We'll, we'll, we'll get through verse 11. Uh, some of you are probably a little relieved because you thought 27, we're going to have a 27 point teaching. No, we're just going to, we're just going to cover the first few tonight. But, uh, but as we're talking about these things, I, I just encourage you, um, don't do this passively. In fact, this is true for every Bible, Bible study. Don't listen passively as if it's just an educational thing, but rather uh, look, at, look at these things more like it's training, uh, more like it's a challenge for you personally. And, and really, really evaluate yourself. Let, let your guard down as, as we look at these things. It's... it's and it's not so that, you know, we're not talking about these things so that you'll feel embarrassed and about yourself and feel down about yourself. You know, it's, it's just about you saying, Jesus, I always want to be on the potter's wheel. I always want to be, be in the process of being shaped and, and, and changed and being molded by, by the potter. So, so let your guard down. Don't, don't, uh, hear these things and say, well, somebody else needed to hear this. You know, uh, think about uh, what, what the Lord is saying to you. Be open and, and evaluate yourself to see how you can grow through this. And, you know, and some people, they will look at, at these things as we go through them and they'll think of it like, it, like a test. Think, be thinking of it like it's a test. And, and when, you, when you look at it like a test, uh, the, what you're going to do is you'll read it and you'll try to evaluate whether you pass or fail. You know, well, I have that, I don't have that, I have that, I don't have that. And, and when, you, when you look at these things like that, there's, there's going to be a strong motive inside of you to try to convince yourself that you're okay um, in, in all of these areas. However, what, instead of thinking of it as a test, instead of calling it that, you know, um, then, then I, I think maybe we could look at it as a, as a calling. Say, instead of saying this is a test to, to, to see, you know, if I pass or fail, but to read this and say, this is the calling of God on my life to, to live like this, to be like this. And, and so when you do that, you know, then you're asking how, how you're not saying did I pass or fail. You're saying, how am I doing here? Can I grow in this area? Is, is there an even higher calling than I've achieved? And chances, chances are the answer is yes. You know, uh, I mean, you, you have not reached sinless perfection yet. As far as I know, nobody here has reached sinless perfection. So, so and if you have, then maybe we could just switch places and you could teach because, uh, you know, that would be good. Uh, so anyway, let's look at it that way. Let's, let's begin. Romans 12, 9 says this. We're just going to read the very first phrase. It says, let love be without hypocrisy. Now, now, this one is so needful for the church. The, the emphasis here is not whether you will love. It's assuming that, that you're going to love as a Christian, but it talks about how to love. And he says to love without hypocrisy. Well, well what is that? What does that mean? What is, what is hypocrisy here? You know, the general idea that we have is of hypocrisy when we think about it, when we think of a hypocrite, we think it's somebody who, who says one thing and does another. And, and it, so, so it'd be like somebody saying, hey, you, you shouldn't smoke. 
while they got a cigarette dangling from their lip, you'd be like, well, that's a hypocrite. That's not what you're thinking. But, and there's an element of that that's true. But, but when you really get down to the meaning of the word and what Paul was saying here, it's, it's not exactly that. Because hypocrisy is, is not so much saying one thing and then doing another. Hypocrisy is faking it. Hypocrisy is faking it. In, in fact, the, the Greek word that's translated hypocrisy actually it speaks of an actor in a play. That's the root of it. So it has this connection to being an actor. Uh, the, and so, so the hypocrite is an actor. It's somebody who's, who's going through the motions, somebody who's playing the part, somebody who's being fake or insincere. So then the question is, why, why does he need to say this? Why does the Holy Spirit need to tell you as a Christian to not be hypocritical in your love? I mean, why does it say to make sure you're, you're, uh, you don't fake love, to make sure that it's genuine love. Well, first of all, I think when we read these things, we need to e examine this realizing that it, that it could be talking about me. I think any time we read in Scripture any, any of these things, we need to say, hey, this could be me that he's talking to. I can't just assume that it's somebody out there that needs this. But, but, but if Scripture is going to bother telling us this, it's, it's because we, we generally need to hear it. So I think <clears throat> we begin by saying, I need to hear this. I need to hear what he's saying. Uh, so you're not alone in this, but let's, let's, let's consider it and think about what it means. I think a great picture of, of hypocrisy and, and even hypocrisy in love is from the book of Acts, the story of Ananias and Sapphira. Everybody remember that story? Ananias and Sapphira. They, they were an example of this hypocrisy. What did they do? Well, they, they brought gifts to, to offer to the church. They, they, they laid the, the, that gift at the apostles' feet. And uh, so, so what had happened was supposedly they, they, they had sold some property. And then they supposedly, they said that they, had, that they gave the entire proceeds to the church. But the fact was they were being deceitful. Which it wasn't that the, the problem was not that they didn't give the whole proceeds. It's that they lied and said that they did trying to make themselves look get it better. So they were faking it. They were playing a part. And as a result, God, God struck them dead because they were pretending to be more loving and generous than they really were. Now, that seems like a very harsh uh, reaction, harsh, harsh punishment. I'm not going to go into this, but you, if you do a study in Scripture, you'll find that very often in Scripture, the very first time something happens, there is a much harsher response from God because He's trying to get the attention of the people and saying, wait a minute, take this seriously. You know, because honestly, if, if that was the reaction to hypocrisy throughout the history of the church, we, we would have a lot smaller church membership, wouldn't we? Because uh, probably all of us at one time or another have acted in some hypocritical way. And, and if that was going to be the, the judgment for it, we would all be in trouble. But you can see it like even in the Old Testament when the, when the law was first given. There were, there were times when that was the case. But I don't want to get into that. But the message, the message is this. Uh, hypocrisy will kill the church. Hypocrisy, playing the part, will kill the church. Uh, and here, here's the part that's really sobering. My hypocrisy will kill my church. My hypocrisy will, will kill my own fellowship of believers. And, and can I tell you this? Maybe even a little bit different way to word it. My hypocrisy will kill, will kill church for me. Because here's what happens. If I'm faking it and then I go to church we tend to filter everything that we see through our own mindset. So if, if I'm faking it and then I see somebody else having an, an honest response to the Holy Spirit and the power of God moving in their life, it's easy for me to look at that person and say, oh, they're just faking it. The reason I think that is because I'm faking it. So hypocrisy will kill the church and it will kill God's work in me. Because I, I'll, I'll begin to reject what God does. That's why, you know, I'm, I've mentioned before, uh, I think it was last week or the week before, I can't remember for sure, I mentioned something about, uh, you know, this tendency to try to, uh, maybe it was two weeks ago, doesn't matter, but this, this whole image management thing where we want to try to control what other people think of us. 
And so there's this unspoken internal pressure. Say somebody's praying for people around the altar and they lay hands on one person and they fall out under the power of God. And then the come, time comes, the next person falls out under the power of God. And then they pray for you. And there's this internal pressure to try to manage your in, image to say, well, I don't want people to think I'm not spiritual. And so there's this pressure to then to fall out just because that's what everybody else is doing. That would be, in a sense, faking it. And the problem with that is then every time it happens to somebody else, you're going to be suspicious thinking, I don't know if that's real or not. And so it kills what God's trying to, trying to do in your life. But it will, it will kill the, the falseness or fakeness that, that some people bring. And listen, sometimes they're not even aware that they're doing it because they're, they're just trying to, they're doing it to, to at least look like they're doing the right thing. So they, they end up putting on airs and, and it can be really, really bad for us. Uh, so... Why would I be hypocritical in love, though? Why would I be hypocritical in love? Well, I, I, what, what would be my motivation for being hypocritical in love, for pretending to love when I'm not really being loving? Well, I think one motivation is just, just to fit in, kind of the same idea of the, what I was just talking about when somebody's prayed for and they fall, somebody prayed for and they fall. There's this, you want to fit in. You, you want to be part of what's going on in the, in, the, in the church. So, so think about it. Here I am in a Christian environment where Jesus is, Jesus is the ideal and, and I'm trying to fit into this group. So sometimes there's this subtle pressure to just kind of pretend and go with the flow. You know, so we're like, oh, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh, praise the Lord. Yeah, you know, and, and so we just kind of go with it. Where in that situation, my responses are, are, are more about me reacting to my environment uh, the, the environment in which I find myself rather than from a genuine genuineness that's within me. So, uh, so, and, and you know what, we need to make sure our church isn't like that. I, I, that I need to make sure that I'm not like that. Um, like, like when I'm praying for someone that I'm really praying for them, you know, that I'm not, you know, it's so easy. It's so weird how we, how we are because Especially, I think, in a Pentecostal church, we have to be really careful because it's really easy to begin praying for somebody. And if you're not careful, you're, you're not even talking to God anymore. You're praying in such a way to make sure that they know that you're praying really spiritually. That we're, we're more concerned about what other people think about how we're praying it. You know, is he praying the right way? And you get this weird pressure on us. It's just a strange thing. It's part of being human. I understand that. But, but when I'm praying for someone, I, I need to make sure I'm really praying. And I don't have to worry about if I say all the right words. You know, because I don't believe God is up in heaven, you know, waiting for us to say all the exact right phrases when we pray. You know, like, like we're praying for somebody to be healed and you leave out one special phrase and he's like, oh, you almost had it. She would have been healed. Now you blew it. I don't, I don't, think, that's, I don't think that's God at all. And so there, there's this pressure to kind of fit in. And we need to make sure that when we're doing these things that we're really doing. If I'm, if I'm praising and worshiping, uh, I need to make sure that I'm not just raising my hands as an act to try to fit in with everybody else. Uh, but, but rather... To, be, to say, Lord, if, if nobody else was here, I'd still be lifting my hands to you. That's the genuine, genuineness. And we need to make sure there's, there's a genuineness. Let your love be genuine. And let it be without hypocrisy because, because people are easily fooled by faking it, aren't they? We are easily fooled by hypocrisy. But the, but the problem, the reason we need to make sure it's genuine is because God is not fooled. He is not fooled. God is not fooled by the hypocrisy of people. He sees right through it. You know, when he chose David to be the, the new king of Israel, after King Saul, Samuel, the prophet went to the house of Jesse and, and he knew that God was going to anoint one of the sons of Jesse to be the next king. And, and it says how, how after he saw all of these, you know, he, the first boy comes in and he's this tall, good looking, very kingly looking young man and 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 Samuel was like surely this is the one I mean he looks like a king and and, and the problem was he was looking at the outward outward appearance but God tells Samuel in 1 Samuel 16 7 and we all we've heard this verse many times it says but the Lord said to Samuel do not look on his appearance 
or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. For man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks in the heart. God is constantly gazing upon our hearts. And, and that should both comfort and frighten us. <laughs> because, because it comforts us because that means he really does understand what I'm feeling in my heart. But it's, there's a little frightening maybe at times because I begin to realize I can't trick him. I can't fool him. I can't play a game. He knows what's really going on. I mean, imagine if all the hypocritical religious activity, all, all the hypocritical religious acting was completely obvious to everybody. Where, where, it, where it, Imagine if everybody always knew when somebody else was faking it, and that's what it's like for God all the time. So, so let your love be without hypocrisy, because if you're living under the Lord, which Paul talks a lot about living under the Lord, there, there is no place for, hip, for hypocrisy because he sees the heart. Now, I want to say that there is a wrong solution to this, this concept of living, uh, let it, let, about not allowing your love to be hypocritical. Uh, I, I think to, um, you know, I, I've seen people fall in this, so I want to mention it to you. I think a wrong solution to hypocrisy and love is accepting a watered-down version of Christianity. And, and that's what I mean by that. Maybe you've heard somebody say something like, well, maybe I'm not living the way I should, should live, but at least I'm not a hypocrite. And so we say these things, so, so, you, so you sort of put your compromise on display, and that's not the cure for this. Not, that's not the answer. The answer is not to say, well, I'm just going to do what I want. I just won't be a hypocrite and that's not the answer. That's not what he's talking about. The cure is not to display my compromise and then pretend as if that's normal Christianity where you live out this worldly version of a compromised Christianity and then you pretend that you're better than the other people because you don't hide your sin. But rather, I think the, the solution is to actually love without hypocrisy. Actually learn how to love. The, the solution is, is just to be genuine, to be loving, I, the solution is to be rather than to simply appear to be. And, and I think a, a lot of people, a lot of us, we often prefer looking good over being good. Because looking good is a lot easier than actually being. So, you know, there's a lady that I heard about who talked to a pastor and, and she talked about how the fact that she, she said that she... The times where she really had fun and where she really enjoyed herself was when she went bowling with her friends. So she'd go bowling with her friends and she said there she could just relax. She could let her hair down. She could just enjoy the night and just have a good time. But then she said, however, when I'm in church, I feel uncomfortable. She said, I just wish I could feel the way I felt. Uh, if, uh, uh, excuse me. I could feel in church the way that I felt when I was bowling with my friends. Well, you know, I think really the answer there is stop faking it in church. You're letting, you're being who you are when you're bowling. Be who you are in church. Don't try to pretend. Don't put on the mask. Uh, and, and because everyone, I've talked about this before, when we put on the mask and pretend, it makes it impossible for us to receive the love of the people around us. Because we know they only love the fake me. If they really knew who I was, they wouldn't love me. That's, that's, so it makes it difficult. But, but you know, you, you feel uncomfortable in church when it's all pretend. So, so of course, you're, you're, you're feeling anxiety just being in the presence of other people because you're not you, you're not being you following Jesus. And of course, I understand there's the, the, the difference between bowling and being in church. And the difference is that when you're bowling, nobody expects you to follow Jesus. So there's no pressure there. Uh, but, but maybe that's why you're feeling uh, uncomfortable. When you're in church, it's, it's a little different. I understand that. But another wrong solution, I'm not going to spend any time on this, uh, but it would be just to avoid the environment that expects me to be like Jesus. So we say, well, I don't want to be a hypocrite so in, in my love, so I'm just not going to do, I'm just not going to try. That's not a solution either. Instead, let's just be 
real Christians and real fellowship with, with one another. That's the calling. The calling is to be rather than just appear to be. So, so this is let love be without, without hypocrisy. And I, th- I think that the rest of these 27 character traits are really tied to this. It's really about love that, that isn't fake. Romans 12 says to let love be without hypo- hypocrisy. And then it gives us this long list of how that really looks in real life. So, so later on in verse 9, the second character trait he says is this. Verse 9, he, he started off by saying, let love be without hypocrisy. And then the second line is, hate what is evil. Hate what is evil. Now, there are, there are three popular compromises that I want to mention uh, as we talk about this concept of hating evil. One, one popular compromise, really, really common in our, in our nation, not just in church, but in our nation, one of the really popular uh, compromises is embracing sin. You know, that's, that's, that would be just embracing whatever the sin is. Whatever, whatever you know, you can name it. I'm not going to go into naming specific sins or anything like that, but that's where you say, you know, I'm just going to embrace it. I'm going to say, this is good. I affirm this. this is, I, I want this. That's what, that's what our world does, and unfortunately, even many churches a second popular compromise is, is different, but it's, it's acknowledging that something is sin, but then actually being embarrassed by the fact that you're saying that it's sin. So, so you, you, I think you may have seen this before, but where, where someone acknowledges sin, but then they feel embarrassed, they're, they're embarrassed to say that something is sin because it goes against the culture to say that something is wrong, so to, say, to say that something is sin, sinful. And, and so they, you know, there's like, well, yeah, the Bible says this is wrong. You know, I'm sorry. I don't want to, you know, and we feel bad about it. Listen, I, I, don't, I don't need to apologize for God. I, I don't. I, I don't need to feel awkward when I say that there is a biblical truth about morality and I, and I can take a stand on that. I can say this is, this is not my idea. This is, what, this is what the Word of God says and I can stand on that. And, and when I... When I act embarrassed over what the Bible says, I think that misrepresents God to do that. So, so that's the second compromise. One is embracing sin. The other is acknowledging sin, but being embarrassed about the fact that, it, that the Bible says it is sin. And the third popular compromise, and we're gonna, not going to talk much about this. We've talked about it more in the past. But that is turning grace into a license to sin, where you say, oh, well, God's grace is Greater than any sin. So, you know, the Bible says where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. So let me just sin it up because God's grace is greater. Um, And that's where somebody uses grace as an excuse to continue to sin. But instead, what should my uncompromised attitude towards sin be? Well, it's right here. It's what he just said. Hate what is evil. Hate what is evil. Now, I want to make this very clear. This is talking about sin and sinful actions. This is not talking about the person who carries them out. He never says anywhere in Scripture to to hate the person who is sinning. In fact, I mean, you can see from in, in the story of Jesus when you read about his life. It's very clear. He loved the person who was sinning. But he didn't compromise, and he always called that person to repentance, didn't he? The woman who was taken in adultery. You know what taken in adultery means? It means she was caught in the act. There's no question of her guilt. But Jesus looked at her like he did so many other uh, sinners and said, said, uh, he said, who's, after the whole story, I'm not going to go through the story, he said, where are those that condemn you? And she said, there aren't any. He said, neither do I condemn you. But he he didn't just leave it there. He didn't say, I I don't condemn your sin. That's not what he said. He said, I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. So he loved the sinner, but he did call the sinner to repentance. So I want to bring that, I want to mention that as up front before we talk about any of this hating evil thing. I want you to understand we're not talking about uh, about uh, being angry at people who sin and hating people who sin. In fact, you know, it's, it's one, of, one of our weaknesses as Christians nowadays in Western evangelical culture is, is the, that, you know, we, we, we get this, you know, this thing where we, 
I don't even know how to say it. Uh, it, it but, but we just, uh, we, I'll put it like this. I've used this phrase before. We, we get upset at other people's sin. But the reality is when we do that, we're angry because they're sinning differently than we are. We, you know, we, we excuse our sin, but then we, we judge other people. So we need to be careful and understand that it's not about the person uh, because God wants to redeem the person. But in order to redeem the person, we do have to speak clearly and, 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 and without reservation, without apology, about what the Word of God says is right and wrong. And we can do that without, without fear and without apology. And we can do it without being mean. Jesus did. So, hate what is evil. This is a great challenge for you as a Christian. Do you hate what's evil? Do you hate what's evil? Now, this is way beyond simply saying that sin is bad. Isn't it? God wants uh, me to, to have a gut, gut reaction of hate towards wickedness. When I see sin, when I see what sin is doing to people, you know, or what it can do to people, God wants me to, my reaction to be that, uh, to, to that sin, to be hate, to where I just despise that. And, it, 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 and that's way beyond just me, me beyond, way beyond just looking at Scripture and saying, well, I read in from the Word of God objectively, that is a sin. This word translated hate means to hate utterly means to despise, means to shrink away from. You know, it's something that you hate so much that you, it, you, you, it implies repulsion and it, it implies a desire for avoidance where you, you hate it so much you can't stand to, to be around it. And so, so that's, that, that's my attitude towards evil things. I, I have to have a hate for it rather than saying, and here's, here's our problem. Let me say this. Sometimes we, we're a lot better at hating the sin in other people's lives than we are hating the sin in our own. And we'll say, well, they shouldn't do that. I, I hate the sin. I hate what it's doing in their life. But then what we do is we say, I know it's wrong, but I really kind of like it. That's a long way from hating that sin in, in my heart. That, that's not a biblical, a biblical attitude to have. So... So this is a Christian character thing. So now how does this, I said that all these things relate to love. How does this relate to love? Well, it relates, relates to love because hating evil, hating what is evil is, is about loving God. It's about understanding who he is. Because ultimately sin, remember this, ultimately sin is, is acting in opposition to or out of, out of alliance uh, 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 with who God is, the character of God. So why is lying a sin? Well, it's not just because it's bad, it's because God is truth. So when we lie, we are speaking out of, an, out of alignment with who He is. Without, we're going against His very character. And so uh, to understand that to hate what is evil, uh, it means I want to share God's attitude towards sin. And so, since he hates sin, he can't, he, can't, he, can't, he can't allow it into his presence. I want the same thing. To see God's attitude towards sin now, I don't, I don't have to really, I don't really need to look any further than the cross to understand how much God hates sin. Um, at the same time, you know, we talked about separating sin and the sinner. I can look at the cross and see how much God hates sin but I can also look at the cross and see how much he loves mankind. Same, same place. You know, I look up on the cross and, you know, I, I don't, you know, and I go, Jesus, did you die for things that are technically wrong? Or did you die for things that are really, really bad? To, to see the hatefulness of sin. I just, I just need to see the blood of Jesus. I need to see his beatings, his, his beard being ripped out, him being nailed to a cross, and, and him saying if there's any other way uh, to understand how much God hates sin. I, all I have to do is look and see what Jesus went through in order to pay, to pay the price, to take the punishment for sin. Now I want to say something that may sound odd and, and not popular in today's world, but I want you to think about this statement. 
Hell is not an over, overreaction from God. Hell is, is not an overreaction from God. Yet there's a lot of people in the world that think it is. Because they think, well, that's an awfully big punishment for telling a lie. But, you know, they say, well, as if they somehow can understand things better than God. But, but here's what I have to understand. If hell is the just and right punishment for sin, then that means... If we think it's an overreaction, that means that we don't really understand how bad sin really is. You know, if hell's not the, an overreaction, then, then maybe sin is way worse than people actually realize. So maybe it's appropriate to really hate this stuff. I, I should hate sin because it sends people to hell. I, I should also hate sin because it causes people to harm one another. I, I, it, it also comes against the very nature and character of who God is. It rebels against the authority and his specific commands against us. In the end, when it comes to the issue of hell, judgment, sin, and, and consequences of sin, we're, we're, we're always going to do one of two things when we think about these things. We're either going to end up demonizing man or we're going to end up demonizing God. What I mean by that is that either I'm going to look at mankind and I'm going to go, wow, you are really messed up. Mankind is really sinful and wicked. Or I'll look at God and go, you know, God, you're kind of taking things a little too far here. You should be a little more reasonable in your response to sin. And in that case... Grace then becomes a thing that's not really even grace. It's just more like understanding. Well, God understands that I make mistakes. And we say that instead of realizing that God pours out this incredible grace upon such wicked sinners. The, the, the realities, the truth is that the depth of the wickedness of sin, understanding how awful and horrible it really is, that's what makes the love of God so amazing. Well, we understand that because when I realize how wicked I've been, I mean how utterly wicked I've been, then I am blown away by the amount of love and grace and kindness and mercy that God has given to me, that, that I'm called a child of God, that he loves me and cares for me, even though I had that utter wickedness inside of me. So, you know, Maybe for some, this is kind of news to you. Maybe this is sort of opening your eyes to say, wow, you know, I don't, I don't tra treat sin like it's really bad in my life. I, I just, I treat it more like it's sort of a good thing that it's just a forbidden fruit that I should avoid. But I think the question is this. Do you think you were saved by a little bit of grace or a whole lot of grace? Because if, if you were saved by a whole lot of grace, then that must mean that it was because your sin was a whole lot of bad. I know that's poor grammar, but you know what I'm trying to say. It, it's good for us to hate sin. So how do, I, how do I apply this to my life? Well, I think we start by asking a question, especially if you've walked with the Lord for a while. You ask yourself, have I stopped hating sin? And I'm not even, I think it's even more important not just saying, have I stopped hating sin in the world? I think it's more important to look internally and say, have I stopped hating sin in me? Have I become too tolerant? Not just in my conversations and things that I say with other people, but in the way I live. Have I become too tolerant of sin? Because, because love does not mean accepting wickedness into my life. You know, there, there are people that say, well, you know, we, we have to just, we have to love the sinner. And they, and they say, what they mean by that is that we have to accept their sin. No, that's not true. I can, I can hate the thing that, you're, that, that, is, that is destroying your life and still love you. Right? Like, you know, I like watching crime shows. I don't know if anybody else likes that sort of thing. But, but I'm, you know, I watch a lot of investigation and discovery, that kind of thing. And, and uh, you know, I watch and you'll see, for example, someone, some... Some man that gets, you know, convicted of murder and he's thrown into jail and he's never going to get out. And, and uh, I'm not making a comment about that. But then often you'll see the mother of that, of that person who committed this horrible atrocity. 
And they'll be talking about how they, they hate what they did, but they will always love their son. And so when we talk about this, I think, I think we need to understand that not just it's, it's true in other people's lives, but it also means that loving myself doesn't mean that I accept wickedness in my love. That, that would actually be fake love, hypocritical love. Psalm 97 says, you who love the Lord hate evil. So, so this teaching in Romans, what he's talking about here is nothing new. Hate what is evil. Now, the third character trait in verse 9 is sort of like the flip side of the coin from hating evil. It says, it says in verse 9 again, cleave to, or another way you could say was cling to what is good. Now, that word cleave means to join oneself to or to become part of something. The idea, this word is actually used uh, in describing marriage. It's used in marriage when two become one. The Bible says that, that a man should leave his, his, his father and mother and should cleave to his wife. Um, that's the whole idea, this joining two. So, so he says to cleave to what is good. Or that means that I am to attach myself to things that are good. You know, a good cause, a good ministry, a good attitude, a good action, a action, a good word. I think all those things apply to cleaving to what is good. All those things, whatever is good. So I, and I think it's really interesting here because there's a little bit of a contrast when I, that I see because we're told to cleave to what is good, not just to love what is good. He said, hate what is evil. You would think the opposite. He would say, hate what is evil, love what is good. But that's not what he says at all, is it? He says, hate what is evil, but cleave to what is good. I hate evil with a, with a repulsion, but I grab hold of what is good, and I desperately hold on to it, and I don't let it go. Why? Because what is good slips away from me very, very easily. Doesn't it? The, you know, we are fish swimming upstream. Uh, I, I, we're, another illustration I've used before, I, I feel like w walking with Christ, with the sinful nature that we have in us, it's like going up the down escalator. You know, that you're, you've got to constantly be moving forward, because if you're not moving forward, you're going to be going the wrong direction. There's no holding steady. There's, you've got to keep moving forward. But we're, we're fish swimming upstream. And what is the tendency for the fish that's swimming upstream? Well, the tendency is to start going with the flow of the stream. That's the natural tendency. And there's a natural tendency towards sin in our own sin nature. You know, I, I have seen believers who at, at a younger age in the Lord actually had a, had a much stronger commitment to holiness in their lives. But as years uh, went by and, and compromise slowly crept in, their, their convictions changed and they started thinking more and more things were okay that they had previously avoided. Now I understand that times, there are times when we understand that as we grow, because there are things like when I was growing up that they said were sin, that now we realize, no, that is not, that is, it wasn't, it's not, you know, like, Maybe, you're, maybe you grew up uh, long enough ago in a Pentecostal church where they, they said, well, if you're in a movie theater and Jesus returns, you're not going to heaven, you know. And, and so we've had these legalistic things that were not scriptural based, scripturally based. And, and, and I'm not talking about those things, but I'm talking about how that if we're not careful, we'll begin to flirt with sin as we live longer because we think we're more secure. We think we don't have to deal with it. We don't have to worry about it. And we'll flirt with that sin a little more and we, and we begin to, to compromise and say, well, this is really not that bad compared to all, what everybody else is doing. And I think this happens so easily, not cleaving to what is good because we get tired we get lazy, we get uh, apathetic, we get sloppy, we get lackadaisical. Not only that, we, we get cravings. You know, we just have things that we want, sinful things that we want, and, and, and we get tired of dying to it, so we give in a little bit here and give in, in a little bit there. And before you know it, you're accepting compromises in your life that you never thought you would ever tolerate. So he says, cleave to what is good. Not just love it. He says, grab hold of it and become part of it. 
Grab hold and don't let go. You know, Titus 2.14 is a good reminder for us. It says, who gave himself for us, and that's talking about Jesus, obviously. He, he gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all lawlessness, law, excuse me, lawlessness and purify for himself a special people. Listen to that. Zealous of good works. As a Christian, one of my character callings is to be active in good deeds, to be active in good works, not for salvation. This is not about earning your salvation. No, Jesus purchased that salvation. That's all completely paid for. But I'm talking about in response to that salvation that he's given to us, I should be zealous to serve the Lord with my life. So, so busy yourself about good things. And, 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 you know, sometimes we get this thing where, where we, you know, we, there's something that we think is a good thing. There's a ministry opportunity, whatever it is. And we, and we start saying, Lord, I just need a confirmation. I just need a confirmation. Can I just give you a little general rule of thumb? And that is, if you lack confirmation, but it's a good thing, do it anyway. Do it anyway. You know, you say yes until your plate is full. Then when your plate is full and opportunities come, that's when you begin to say, wait a minute, now I need to make sure that I'm functioning in the area that God has called me and where he has gifted me. And so then I can begin to, t but if there's, an, if there's a need, if there's an opportunity to, to serve, we need to have that zeal inside of us that says, yes, I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll serve. I, I'll, I'll be zealous in this good work. Go for it in serving the Lord. You know, I mean, I would much rather stand before God and have him say, you know, you tried to do a lot more than I actually called you to do. than him have to look at me and say, why did you stand around waiting for me to confirm everything that you had, every opportunity you had? Because I think, I think God wants us to mature. You know, when you, with your kids, uh, as they grow, you want them to mature to the place where they don't have to ask you about every little thing, right? Can I get an amen from any of the moms in here? You know, so, you know, you want your kids. When your kid is three and they spill milk all over the kitchen floor, you, they're going to come running to you and say, Mommy, Mommy, Daddy, Daddy, I spilled milk. What do I do? And you go in there and you help them clean it up. But by the time they're 15 years old, you want them to have matured to a point that when they drop that milk on the floor and it goes everywhere, that they can go through a thought process where they say, you know what, I believe that the will of my father, the will of my mom at this moment in time would be for me to get some paper towels and some other towels and clean up this mess. They don't, you don't, they don't need, you don't want them to wait, you know, until they get the okay from you should I clean this mess up? What should I do? I'm not getting an answer. I'm just going to wait until I get an answer. And I think, I think we need to realize he wants us to mature in him enough to where we say, Lord, I see a mess here. I know it's your will that something's be done. So I'm going to jump in. I'm going to do what I can. And Lord, if you've got somebody else that needs to do this, I know you'll send them this way. And, and then we'll work together. But I, I think that's, that's about cleaving to what is good. That is being zealous for good works. Now, I'll tell you this. If you cleave to what is good and you hate what is evil, I guarantee you that eventually it's going to come up and you will be accused of legalism. If you do this, if you truly hate what is evil and cleave to what is good, I want to say this. It doesn't mean that you're dumping your conviction on other people. But we'll talk about convictions later in Romans 14. However, you will be accused of being a legalist. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to say a phrase to you. I'm going to see if you've heard this. And um, I'm going to talk about it for a little bit. You ever heard this phrase? Too often Christians are known for what they're against instead of what they're for. You ever heard that phrase? Now, I understand what, what most people are trying to say when we say that. You know, when, when I use that phrase, I'm, I'm, what I'm saying is we can't just emphasize sin without talking about grace. We have to talk about the solution. We have to talk about the answer. But, but I think that sometimes that phrase has been used in an unhealthy way uh, because some people use that phrase to propagate the idea 
that Christians should only be known for what they're for and not for what they're against. My, my question is, is that what the apostles did? Is that what Jesus did? Is that what the Old Testament prophets did? The answer is no, no, and no. Not, not even close. Uh, to use a, the phrase in that manner, it, it, that is modern American tolerance entering into the preacher's mouth that he can then tell people to stop hating evil because, if, because you don't want to be known for what you're against, only for what you're for. But, but here's the reality. The truth is, if you are for something, you're against something else. It's, it's just inevitable. You know, I, I am for paying the right amount of money when I go to Taco Bell. Can I, anybody, you know, some of you are like, why in the world would you go to Taco Bell? I like Taco Bell, so get off my back. Um, but uh, I'm for paying the right amount of money when I go there. Therefore, that means I'm against paying the wrong amount of money. Right? Just think about this. This is logical. You know, but then, you know, if we use the same logic, we'd be like, oh, oh, but I don't want to, be, want to be known for what I'm against. Well, you know, why are we tap dancing around things? Let's just not play these games because I think it's a slippery slope to compromise. And what it does is it compromises my love for God in order, and the reason we do that, we compromise our love for God in order to placate and appease a wicked world, to make them feel better about us. I, but the truth is, I've got to do both. I've got to hate evil and cleave to good. I must, under, I must stand against wickedness, but I also stand for righteousness. I, I can't pick one side or the other. I have to do both. That's what the Scripture teaches. And, and listen, if nothing else, if I will do this in my life, both sides of the coin, if I will do this in my life, it will keep me from my own tendency towards sin. So the next time you hear somebody say, Christians have to be known for what they're for, not, uh, uh, not for what they're against. J just ask them, can you show me that in the Bible? You know, the ironic thing about that statement is when they say, we can't be known for what we're against, we got to be known what we're for. The ironic thing is that that's their way of saying that they're against you being against things. <laughs> so, so it's self-refuting uh, in and of itself. My, my thought is, when, when you face this, when you face charges of legalism, when you face these things, just, just be gracious. Don't get in an argument. There's no point in that. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about them. Just keep plowing the field, field that God gave you to plow. Just, just keep living the life that the Lord's called you to live. Let's look at number four. Character trait number four, verse 10. He says, be devoted to one another with brotherly love. Now, I find it interesting that he starts off by saying, let love be without hypocrisy, hate evil, cleave to good. And then it says, now be devoted to one another with brotherly love. So you, you, you see hating evil, cleaving to good. That's how you love God. Being devoted to one another with brotherly love. That's how you love people. R really, it's just love being played out in, in two different spheres. He says that we should love each other with brotherly love. In other words, you know what he's saying? He's saying, don't be the family that doesn't treat each other like family. We, brothers and sisters in Christ, are, are actual, eternal brothers and sisters. So we're called to have a loving family type of affection, a familial affection for, for one another. Uh, and the idea here is about having a tender heart, that, I, that I'm not closed off to you. I have a soft heart towards you as my brother or sister in Christ. Listen, even if you're failing, even if, even if you've blown it, that, you, that I still treat you like my brother or sister. My heart of compassion and, and love does not fail. That's what he's talking about. Now, I, want, I wanted to say this. I, th I think that people... That church hop. You know what I'm talking about with, when I, about church hoppers, right? Um, I think that people that church hop fail to follow this character trait as a Christian. Because how in the world am I being devoted in brotherly love when I keep rejecting whole groups of believers? Now, now it's one thing, you know, to say, you know, like maybe you move into 
uh, uh, city or maybe you're newly saved and you say, I just don't know what church uh, in which I should follow, fellowship. I'm, I'm trying places out to figure out where to plant my feet, to try to figure out where I'm going to grow my roots. But, but, uh, but at the same time, if, if someone consistently hops from one church to another, if someone goes to a church for a year and then leaves, and then goes to another church for a year and then leaves, and then goes to another church for a year and leaves, and goes to another church for a year and leaves, and then just repeats this over and over and over and over again, I think there's probably a lack of love in that person for the body of Christ. And maybe there's probably some level of pride in there that they need to deal with. I remember one time a guy at a church I was pastoring, he he was going from church to church to church, and eventually he left our church. And eventually he started his own church, his own house, because he said nobody was doing it right. Okay, well, there's a lack of love for the body of Christ there, but there's also a pride issue, but I don't have time to get into that. You know, you, you're, you, you, when you do this, you've you, you got to remember you're there to get fed. There's no question. You're, you're, the, you're there to get served. You're there to get blessed. But we have to ask ourselves, what about being devoted to others in brotherly love? What about not just being fed, but feeding? What about not just being served, but serving? What, are not, what about not just being blessed, but being a blessing? Being devoted to others in brotherly love. You know, and listen, that, that reality is even more evident in people who completely disfellowship entirely. I mean, at least church hoppers are going to church, right? So, so they're, they're a little bit better, but, but, you know, but there are those who just cut themselves off completely from the rest of the body of Christ, and sometimes with, sometimes with great bitterness, and, and then they end up with this tiny little circle of other believers who sort of fit their really high requirements for how people can act around them. But, you know, that is just not the kind of life that we're called to live as Christians. We're called to be part of a big family. We're called to be a part of a big family. Ultimately, it is not enough just to show up at church, just the same way that if you're part of a family, it's not enough just to get up in the morning and go sit in the living room and say, I'm part of this family, you know, but never interact with the family, never do anything with family, never talk with the family, never love on the family, never serve the family, but just be there, show up once in a while. Ultimately, it's not enough just to show up at church. You have to be devoted to the people of that church in brotherly love. That's what he's talking about here. Let's look at number five, character trait number five says this, verse 10. He goes on and says, prefer one another in honor. Prefer one another in honor. Now this is actually the opposite of the world. The worldly person seeks to elevate himself above others, right? That's, that's kind of the agenda of the world. Elevate yourself, lift yourself up above, above others. However, the biblical Christian, the, the calling for us is to seek to elevate others above yourself in honor, in honor, respect above yourself. Specifically, it's the idea of giving honor, respect, value, status. Now, this is really, really just a reflection of Jesus because he made himself low. He made himself low of no respect that he might raise us up and, and give us glory. I, I mean, you talk about the extreme example. So, so Jesus calls me to do the same thing. In fact, I, I like the way a couple of translations uh, put this. The ESV puts it this way. It says, outdo one another in showing honor. Isn't that awesome? Like make it a competition. See who can honor the, each other the most. Wouldn't that be a wonderful place to, to attend church? If everybody in church was trying to outdo one another in honoring the other people? It's awesome. I like the way a New Living Translation says it. It says, take delight in honoring each other. The worldly way is to take delight when I'm honored. The Jesus way is to take delight in honoring each other. It means that the honor is preferred to them instead of me. Now, this, this really, really goes against our, our natural grain, doesn't it? I'll show you honor, but I don't want to show you more honor than you're showing me. Right? We, we have this 50-50 rule. Like, like, I'll do for you as you do for me. 
You know, it's that kind of that attitude. I, I treat my friends well, but my enemies better watch out. Well, that is completely unbiblical. Let me just ask this. What if God treated us like that? We, we, we'd be in a lot of trouble if God says, I treat my friends really well, but, I, but my enemies better watch out because Christ died for us while we were still his enemies. We want, we want to offer people honor, but then the minute they disrespect us, we just write them off and we don't respect them anymore. How, however, the calling of Scripture is to respect them anyway, to honor them anyway, even if they're not honoring you. Our goal as a follower of Christ is, I want to show you more honor than you're showing me. I want to outdo you in showing honor. I want to outdo you. I don't care how much you're showing. If you show me a great deal of honor, I'm going to try to outdo you by showing you even more honor. That's the character calling of a believer. And Jesus is my example because he certainly did that for me. And that's what I'm being asked to do as a follower of Jesus. You know, you know, I think we really need this reminder as a church. I'm not talking about just our church. I'm talking about the church in America, uh, you know, because you might show up at a church and at first you're like, this is kind of funny. You go through this honeymoon phase when you first start attending a church and you're like, man, these, these people are so godly. They're, these people are amazing. They're just, they're just beautiful. They love the Lord. Oh, they're so great. And then one day somebody tells a joke that, that you don't like or they say something that you think is wrong or they act unspiritual in some way and then all of a sudden your entire perception just shifts and changes. And what ends up happening is when we, when we do that, what ends up happening is that the only people that we really respect becomes the people that we don't really know. Guess what would happen if you did get to know them well? You'd no, you'd no longer respect them. Can, can, can you still show godly, loving respect and honor to the people with whom you are the closest, to the people you know the best? Because in a way, it's, it's kind of easy to show honor to strangers because you, you can fill in the gaps with your fanciful imaginations about how wonderful they are. But, but, but can you show respect and honor towards the people you know the best especially the ones that you know well enough to know their flaws. That's, that's the challenge. Can you outdo them in showing honor? Do, or, or do you see them as a problem? You know, do, do you look at them and see a series of criticisms? You know, where I call out their name and you're like, oh man, you just don't know all the problems with that guy. Outdo them in showing honor. Outdo them in showing, showing honor. And this is talking particularly about dealing with believers. I mean, do, do you see those people as vessels of the Holy Spirit who will spend eternity glorified, ruling and reigning with Christ? Do, do I see them as called of God? Outdo them in honor and respect. You know, it breaks my heart to see married couples that have stopped respecting each other. And, and when it happens, sometimes... You know, they have guests into the house and, and the other people notice, say, say the, 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 the wife in the, in the marriage, they notice, you know, her giftedness and how the things that she does while they're there and they're very grateful and they express that. But the husband is the last one and never, never even sees that. They, they've lost respect or vice versa. It can be the other way around, you know, but, it, but, it, but the truth is no one should appreciate the people I love more than me. No one should see their giftings. No one should see the wonderful things that they do more than I do. Really, I want to outdo in showing honor. And we have to realize this is a very deliberate attitude. It's not something that happens accidentally. This is a deliberate attitude. E even if I do have valid criticisms, criticisms, which I probably do, because everybody here is broken. Everybody has their faults. But even if that's the case, I should still seek to show honor because Christ showed such incredible honor to me. Okay, let's read verse 11. Verse 11 gives us the next three character traits. It says this, Do not be lazy in diligence. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. 
Do not be lazy in diligence. Now, the word lazy here includes the idea of lacking in ambition, which, by the way, the, the Bible very clearly says we should not have selfish ambition, but it never condemns godly ambition. We can have a godly ambition to become more like Christ. So he's talking about lazy here is the idea of lacking in ambition. And the word diligence has the idea of eagerness or, or doing your best. So, he, so he's saying here, do not be lazy or do not ha- lack the ambition uh, in doing your best. In doing your best in what? In all that you do as under the Lord. Because that's what his call has been all along here. He's saying, listen, it's, it's, we lay our bodies as living sacrifices. All we do, we do under the Lord. Colossians 3.17 says, and whatever you do, whatever you do, in word or deed, whether it's something you, you just speak or just something that you act out, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to the, God the Father through Him. You know, when I think about diligence, I think a way to understand it is diligence isn't about the start of the race, Right? Everybody starts the race well. At least most people start the race well. Some, some of us might stumble out of the blocks. I don't know. But, but you know, picture this long cross-country marathon race. The gun goes off and the, the, the runners take off running and they're running well. They just, you know, uh, they, they start off really well and they usually end the race fairly well. Because you sort of get this adrenaline rush right at the end when the finish line is there. But listen, diligence is that long, boring part after the start and before the finish. That's diligence. Christianity is a marathon. It's a marathon. In serving the Lord, in in all the things you do is under the Lord, there's a diligence that's required. And I I think this plays out where I I start by, you know, doing it uh, out with the zeal of the Lord, doing it for, for the Lord, and then sometimes I... What happens is I get into the routine, I get into the habit of it, and, and I sort of uh, uh, start sort of reducing my output and my energy. You know, and after years of serving the Lord in some area, instead of being better at it, I'm actually worse at it because I've gotten into some bad habits. I've gotten lazy. I've, I've stopped setting the bar really high. I've become accustomed to lowering my standards. And we just let things slip. I mean, it's like, you know, we've all eaten at restaurants like this. You know, when a restaurant first opens up, uh, that's, that's a great time to go to a restaurant. Because you know what restaurants are like when they're brand new? They give you free food. <laughs> they do. They do stuff like that. They give you extra portions. They make sure everything's fine. You know, your meal comes out. And then like three minutes later, the owner comes out right behind you to ask how your meal is. Oh, is everything okay? Can I get you anything? How about a free appetizer? Tell your friends to come check us out. And then four or five years later, you go back and it is just not the same anymore. Now, all of a sudden, you know, you're like, now you're looking and say, this does not look like the picture on the menu here. Things have changed. And if that does happen, if the quality of the restaurant keeps going down, a couple of years later down the road, guess what? It's probably going to be another new restaurant in the same building. Do you do your ministry, your marriage, your, your friendships, your own reading of the word, your, your prayer time, do you do these things with the zeal of a newer believer? Or are you like the guy that's halfway through the marathon and you can't see the end and you can't see the beginning anymore and you're just tired? The idea of not being lazy in diligence, this is a really big eye opener because the question I have to ask myself is, am I just doing good enough or am I really going for it for the Lord? It's a good reminder for us. Take a fresh look at your life and ask, Lord, am I being lazy in diligence? The next one is, he said, be fervent in spirit. And this phrase is used one other time in Scripture in in the book of Acts, in Acts 18.25. And he uses this phrase talking about Apollos. Apollos was preaching and it says that he was fervent in spirit. He, He was so energized by the Holy Spirit that it just sort of overflowed into his life and into his ministry So he was fervent in spirit. He's zealous. He's excited about the Lord. Um, Diligence, 
seems to be about actions and fervent in spirit seems to be about a spiritual overflow in my life. Because the, the word fervent here actually comes from a word mean boi- that means boiling, a boiling spirit. In fact, that's one of the reasons I like the way the simple English Bible translates this, this phrase. In Romans 12, 11, it says, serve the Lord with a boiling spirit. That's just a great mental picture for me because it's, you know, it's not just a little uh, pot of water sitting there simmering a little bit, but when it's, you ever, I mean, you've seen a pot of water when it's on a full boil, it's just churning. And that's the picture of how we're to serve him. So it, it seems to be referring to being so filled with the Holy Spirit that it just sort of boils over in your life. What is this like? Well, what what Jesus wrote to the church in Ephesus in the book of Revelation may relate to this idea of being fervent in spirit. So let let me read to you the letter in Revelation to the church of Ephesus and see if you think this connects with the idea of being fervent in spirit. It says this, To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, He who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, says these things, I know your works, your labor, and your patience, that you cannot bear those that are evil, who are evil, and you have tested those who say they are apostles but are not, and have found them to be liars. You have endured and have been patient, and for my name's sake have labored and have not grown weary. But I have something against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your candlestick from its place unless you repent. But this you have, you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give permission to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. This idea of being fervent in spirit is a thing that the, that the new believer understands very well. Because they've just found Jesus, or really more accurately, Jesus found them. He's rescued them. And they're like, oh man, I just, I just, I'm just so in love with the Lord. Uh, my spirit is thriving in, in Him. So I think new believers see it. And often old believers see it. But middle-aged believers sometimes don't. And middle-aged, by that I'm not talking about middle-aged in the sense that we think of of young, old, or middle-aged in our life. But I'm I'm talking about those who are not new believers anymore, but they're at the same time, they're not that ancient in the faith guy either. You know, it it seems like like those two groups uh, of people sort of have the corner of the market on this whole fervency of spirit thing. I see it all the time. People, People who have you know, are, are brand new in the Lord and they are so fervent in their spirit for God and they're so excited. But then I've also seen older people who've walked with the Lord for a long time. And there's something about that when you look back on your life and you see his faithfulness that it stirs up that fervency in you. So I've seen older believers that are just, their, their spirit is just burning and boiling. But sometimes for those of us in the middle, we have so many things going on. We have, we have so many distractions that we lose that sense of fervency. But you know what? It comes down to your relationship with Jesus Christ. It comes down to going back to those early days of your walk with Jesus. He said to the church in Ephesus, he said, you've lost your first love. You've lost that fervency. He said, go back and do the things you did in the beginning. Going back to those early days and remembering what he's done for you. And then finding this revival of your spirit. Finally, the last one we're covering tonight. We'll do this quickly. He says, do not be lazy in diligence. Be fervent in spirit. And then he said, serve the Lord. Serve the Lord. Now, what I like about this one is this one makes me the servant. Makes me the servant. There's a beautiful Christian song, an old song that says, make me a servant, humble and meek. Lord, let me lift up those who are weak. May the prayer of my heart always be. Make me a servant, make me a servant, make me a servant today. You know, that is a good prayer. That's a good prayer. And it's very, very Christian. I mean, could you see how the world might walk into a room full of Christians singing, make me a servant? And they'd be like, 
a servant? What's wrong with you guys? But, but that's not the way it is for us because we see service to the Lord as such an honorable and beautiful thing. We're like, I get to serve the Lord. I get this. That's the reminder. He, I am a servant. I am a servant. You know, and it's easy to remember the, uh, this when you're, when you're doing what the world considers and what we sometimes consider the menial task. But, but when we step into ministry and leadership roles, we sometimes forget that we're servants. So this is a good reminder to tell us you're here to serve. You're here to serve. You're here to serve. However, I think it's important to notice that I'm not just serving. Whom am I serving? He said, serve the Lord. I'm serving the Lord. You know what that means? That means that all this stuff that I'm talking about, not being lazy in diligence, being fervent in spirit, it's all connected to my relationship with God because He's the one I'm serving. It's not just performance, it's relationship. So tonight I'm teaching a Bible study. I'm teaching a Bible study to you. But I'm teaching it as unto the Lord. This is, this is part of my walk with God. What an honor and what a privilege that I get to do this. I do it all unto Him. Now, now, now here's the thing. If I see my diligence and, and my fervency and my, my hating of evil and my clinging to what is good, uh, if I see my being devoted to one another in brotherly love and outdoing others in honor, if I see all of those things as service unto the Lord, well, you know what? Now it's all worship. Now it's all worship. It's all an act of worship unto Him. It's relational now. It's not about the acts that I do, but it's that I'm doing it to serve Him out of this relationship I have with Him. Now, we're, we're going to continue through these next week, and I want, to, I want to close with this. I want to challenge you to do this. I want you to, to go home tonight and maybe, or, or maybe tomorrow morning, and I want you to read through these, these character traits again, not, 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 not even just the ones that I did, but from nine through several verses on, you can read them, but, but I want you to read through them, and I want you to just begin to pray and just say, Lord, help me to see the things that you're trying to show me. Help me to see what you're trying to show me. Help me to be able to grow. Help me to, 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 to keep myself on that potter's wheel where you're shaping me and you're changing me. Because listen, if the last time you changed as a believer was a year ago, something's wrong. We should always be in the process of being shaped and changed. Or as Paul would say in Romans 12, being renewed in our mind. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we, we, we just thank you for your holy word. We thank you, Lord, that it, that it does target us, but it's like the most gentle surgery in our souls that, that you, you target us, but it's, it's the gentleness of your love that, that deals with us. Lord, we, we just ask that you would open our eyes by, by your Holy Spirit to see the things in the Word that apply to our lives and show us how to put these things into action. We, we want to be growing in Christ's likeness, Lord. We, we want to put on, the, 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 put on true Christian character. Help us to, to do this without arrogance or pride, but Lord, help us to do this as an example for others and, and so that we might be able to serve them. Lord, we pray that you would do a work in us. Lead us and guide us, transform us. Lord, make us servants. Make us servants. Make us humble and meek to lift up others, to encourage others, to outdo others in honor. Lord, help us not to see the world through the eyes of the world, but to see through the eyes of our Lord. Change us, Lord God. In the strong name of Jesus, we pray.